Well, I, I might just sit then. It's <laughs> informal up here. Oh, hey y'all. Um, should get rid of this thing. Yeah, got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot so like don't don't be too silly be a little silly okay is it are we rolling it's already recording right okay perfect uh hello everyone <laughs> couldn't, couldn't help myself uh bringing back the cringy opening slides um should i skip some of this i feel like we know or just go for it just full send all right um well i'm michael um <laughs> most of you probably know me by now my i come to you from the fields of environmental science landscape architecture and fine arts um and i often reflect on these uh, as, or I reflect on my own work rather as problem solving, I think above all else. And to me, each of these disciplines are just different tool sets in that problem solving um, pursuit. The picture you're seeing here is in Windsor, Ontario, and it's taken in Black Oak Heritage Park. Uh, and that's my bike down there. And in the summertime, this is a pretty common place to find me wandering around on the river's edge, uh, taking it in. And this photograph here is kind of a, a time when I maybe brought some of that critical uh, questioning and my love for being around the river's edge together. Uh, in the top corner, you can see uh, a big factory, which is a pretty common site along the Detroit River and really got me thinking about what are all of these things doing and impacting um, these ecosystems? And so from here forward, that water became a strong component of the work that I do. Okay. Um, a major, I guess, component of the work I do is uh, citizen science, uh, which can mean a lot of things for a lot of different people. But for me, it's this idea of allowing people who aren't scientists or who aren't part of the academy to participate in science, whether that's creating uh, data or examining data or creating devices to go get said data. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. Uh, it's been a, another common theme in my work is trying to build the tools that I need to do this investigation. And part of that is also falls under, I guess, critical making, you could call that. Um, which also has a bunch of different meanings, but uh, to me, it's often um, using devices maybe outside the realm of their intended purpose or also being um, kind of critical of their use or, or the use of technology. And so as all of those things have a big environmental impact, I really try to bring that into uh, my work as well. Um, I just found this quote in a book I've been attempting to read, and I thought I would just read it to you because I think it really sums up uh, how artists can interact with uh, scientific practices. Uh, and this comes from Joanna Page, and it's her book, uh, Decolonizing Science in Latin American Art. Artists' primary aim is rarely to solve a particular problem, however, but to challenge our thinking and our practices in relation to the natural world in a way that questions the assumptions of humanism and modernity to help us understand the impact of new technologies far beyond their intended material benefits or to place Western scientific knowledge within a constellation of different beliefs and practices. Another pretty solid theme too is this idea of ecological grief. Uh, I'm sure those feelings have been around for some time, but that phrase is starting to come to the surface as a, a kind of a catch-all for uh basically mourning a loss of access to different environmental things and maybe it's 
uh, access to water, uh, drinking water, or maybe it's access to places of respite. But this idea that we're becoming more aware of the loss of these um, critical pieces to our existence. Um, yeah, and so I guess environmental issues are extremely complex and they cross ecological boundaries, social boundaries, economic boundaries, and cultural boundaries. And it permeates into all facets of our life in how we eat, what we dress. Unfortunately, not everyone feels the same intensity of these impacts, which is uh, yet another complexity to the topic of environmental issues. I think the American dream still seems tangled up in these goals and aspirations for success. And we're coming to terms that this goal has a very high environmental cost and future generations are starting to become more aware of this. And despite the overwhelming amount of data available, there is so much misinformation out there that like an education system is being eroded, our faith in scientific institutions. And there are many powerful systems uh, in place that try to keep the status quo as it is. And so in the middle of this chaotic storm, like how do we disarm and have conversations uh, around our environment and our relationship with that environment? Uh, and so um, that's kind of where my work comes in. And I think the sneaky tactic I try to use is the invitation. And for me, that's an idea of creating wonder and creating interest and asking viewers to come in and uh, allowing them to enter into these complex issues on their own terms and using this work as maybe a, do a doorway or an olive branch to, to begin these um, difficult conversations. So before I get into what I've been working on here, I thought I would just jump into a few past works to give you a bit of context for where, where I come from or how I've been uh, approaching this topic. So very often I'm using a lot of different technologies, devices and tools. So I use a lot of different coding languages, um, Bash, C++, different patch-based coding languages. There's a lot, often a lot of hardware involved. So Arduino, Raspberry Pi, um, other devices like that. There's often different environmental inputs involved, data sets, uh, physical samples. Um, and so just the nature of this work, there's a lot of moving parts and everything is often very fickle, uh, which I don't think I intentionally put into the work, but it just sort of came in. And um, also, I guess it's also partly because of the iterative, iterative and experimental nature of a lot of these works, um, but they often require me to continue having them work or function properly. And I also really like to add elements of playfulness when, whenever I can. So this work is called, I'm never gonna pronounce this correct on the first run, <laughs> Anthropogeny. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, built around the opportunity of having an absolutely enormous uh, floor to ceiling projection system at the University of Windsor. Um, a colleague, Dr. Nicholas Papador, you can see in the corner, approached me to um, create a work with him. And we were handed this data set that was, uh, I think it was global average temperatures. And um, basically the invitation was, here's this data set, do something with it. So uh, we sat down, broke it down, found some patterns and tried to figure out how we could turn this into a pretty impactful performance. And so, um, I created a, uh, a pat, like a program that would allow me to present the data. And what you're seeing there are all the data points um, for, for temperature. On the top, you're seeing the year. Uh, so that will correspond to a data point and then some imagery um, that also correlates to what's causing the impacts during those, those time periods. Uh, and Dr. Papador, um, he was creating a piece for the marimba, so he was also using those data points to guide which chords he was picking and like some of the intensities. So uh, together, we had the opportunity to to perform that for an event called Science on Tap, and that's what you're sort of you're seeing here. So I'll just give you a brief uh, excerpt so you can get a sense of how this thing is working. Unfortunately, there's no sound. Sorry, folks. Oh, I'm 
that. So as this is happening live, I'm manipulating the video and adding some distortion uh, to give a sense of kind of urgency and discomfort. And all the while, uh, the whole background is uh, that red color and the red is getting more and more intense as uh, in response basically to the, to the data points. So as the temperature gets hotter, the red is getting brighter. Uh, and the idea was to, by the end, really dramatize that the whole room is red and, and kind of warm. So um, that would have been the final stage. So you're really getting beamed. And the screen in there would probably be five times larger than this. So you can imagine it really, really filled the room by the time it was done. Um, this next work, much more easy to pronounce, the pollution piano. Um, so this was a, a strange device I created that plays water samples, essentially. So. Uh, we did a workshop a little bit earlier last week uh, that used some of these similar principles, but I have an Arduino that's taking uh, samples of uh, each of the water tubes you're seeing there, and it's playing some pitches um, in response to how con conductive each sample is. Uh, so I have a little bit here to, to demonstrate, but each of these samples were taken from different spots in the Detroit River. Um, Kind of after the fact, it it occurred to me that this is also kind of a map. Um, the samples were taken along the river, and these are actually in geographical order. So you're sort of able to see and hear the span of the river, um, or at least along the, the Windsor um, shoreline. And uh, after I finished that, I wanted this to be more of a standalone device that last one was attached to my laptop so this was version two they got a little bit more complex a little bit more um a little more user interface there's extra knobs and things that you can do to impact the sound and um it's maybe more akin to a synthesizer at this point um i don't have a great video so i had to just sort of play a video and smash some audio over the top so you can get a sense of how this one's working um well, it's going to be wacky out of sync, but just to give you a sense, so this one you can hear the sounds are a lot more complex. Um, I was actually able to add like an attack and a decay and a lot of uh, more common synthesizer uh, adjustments and functions. That okay, it's not necessarily a great sounding instrument. It's really bizarre because you can play up the keys, but you might not go up in pitches. It's just sort of whatever the samples give you. So uh yeah, it's a little bit chaotic. Uh, and this last piece I wanted to show you is called Take a Closer Look. This was um created in the University of Windsor in the uh bio art lab that's that's there. Uh and the basis of the piece is some um, um I think it was a coli bacteria that we we're able to modify to glow under UV light. So under normal light conditions, um, like you're seeing here, um, you're just seeing the base color. And then as I'll show you, uh, it will glow under UV light. Um, and at the very bottom, it's really hard to see, but there's a tiny little um, distance sensor. I, th I think it was uh, an infrared sensor. I needed something to go through the glass basically because the bacteria cannot leave the lab. So this is sort of a strange work that's stuck in the lab. Um, and so the little sensor would detect when you got close and that's how it would turn on, which is kind of a play on the name, take a closer look. So you had to actually come forward and interact with it to get it to, to give you some feedback. Um, and this frame is actually just taped onto the window on the outside of the lab. So it almost looks like you've got a porthole into the lab, but the, the work is contained behind, behind glass. Um, and here you can see uh, just some early iterations of what that design might be. And it was just sort of kind of some playfully future tribal type uh, um, imagery. I don't know if you know what I've referenced there. Um, but you can see on the other side, I've actually scraped out bacteria onto this plate in that shape. 
Um, and I think the plate was about that big. So this was a pretty, pretty big guy. Uh, what you're seeing here, I had an assistant help me pour the agar mix, which is the growing medium that bacteria likes to sit on and uh, can thrive really well in. It's kind of like jello, so you have to do one big pour. <laughs> so it's great to have some help for that. And then once it hardens up, I was able to, uh, to draw on it and get that shape that you saw. And then here's a quick video just showing showing it in action. You can see the light changes pretty, um, pretty dramatic. All right, so that brings us to what was I doing here for the last little while? <laughs> I guess a lot of things. Um, I had an opportunity to do a lot of learning. We ran a workshop, which was really fun. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this was building little noisemakers that we shoved into lots of weird and smelly things to see what sort of sounds we could generate. Um, I think my favorite was we had pickle juice, ice cream, and coffee, which is pretty great. Um, also, I had an opportunity to play with some of the technology here, so got to engage with the 3D printer uh, to get some of those water samples. I don't have arms long enough to reach into the harbor, so I was able to make this little jar holder on a string and, and dip it into the river or the, the harbor rather and get my uh, get my samples. Um, and so just I guess a bit of context about what I was doing here. So my proposal was to explore augmented reality in the context of environmental data and storytelling. And um, admittedly, I came in pretty, pretty low in terms of the knowledge about AR. So I really got um, Lone wide open trying to figure out how to wrap my head around all the tools and um, challenges. But augmented reality, for those who are a bit newer to the term, is essentially a layer of digital data that's overlaid onto our reality. And it differs from virtual reality, where you're totally in a completely um, fabricated digital environment, where augmented reality is pretty critical that you see the actual world around you through whatever device. Uh, medium that you've got, typically a cell phone. But interestingly, some early examples, this is from some GM truck in the early 2000s that used like a heads up display. And that's that's an augmented reality in, in some terms too. So in many ways, this technology has been around for a long time. Um, it's just been slow to uh, be in the hands of artists and other people to really engage with it. Probably the most prominent example would be Pokemon Go, I guess, from a cultural standpoint that people recognize, even if they don't know what augmented reality is, that seems to be one that keeps uh, or grabs people's uh, or cues them into what, what that is. Um, so I guess, uh, what's the next slide here? Great. <clears throat> so my goal is to be able to feed environmental data into this uh, to hopefully generate some forms and inform the stories that I wanted to tell. And I really was hoping to have everything um, very location specific. So coming from landscape architecture, my starting point for problem solving or uh, exploring is often in the mapping process. Um, and arriving here, the harbor was a very striking form and it instantly drew me in. So that's ended up being the main focus of where I wanted to um, grab data from and, and sort of express with this augmented reality system. Uh, it was also because of its size very easy to access on foot. So that, that helped a lot too. And so what you're seeing here is uh, just the map of the harbor uh, and overlaid on top are, uh, is a height elevation uh, color gradient to show the topography of the hills and surrounding area. Um, Part of my process is also trying to collect some of my own data. So um, I grabbed some sound recordings. I made a really makeshift underwater recorder. So I, I tried to grab some underwater sounds as well. Uh, and also just cataloging things that caught my attention, different um, piers, different um, lights, different things to rope your boat onto, just all these different things that really said St. John's to me. Uh, so there's a lot of options out there, which is something I didn't quite realize. Um, unfortunately, most of them have a paywall for access. 
a lot of the options were subscription and they seemed very geared towards marketing. Um, and I was also pretty interested in staying away from big developers like Meta, Google, and Apple uh, to get away from being stuck with proprietary tools or having my work eventually stuck in some system that I didn't uh, want to participate in later. And another thing is I really wanted the work to be seamlessly accessible for users. So um, as I'll get into each of these systems um, has to have different pros and cons and different ways of accessing or starting that augmented reality experience. Um, so these are the, the three main ones that I ended up going through. Um, Unreal Engine, Adobe Arrow, and an A-Frame. Um, so I guess as an artist, how do I prescribe some control over the artist or the, the viewer experience so that I'm ensuring you see what I intend you to see? Um, so with augmented reality, you need some kind of cue to begin that experience, um, to start the app, to, to know that you're in the right spot, to place the object in, in, in an, your reality. So you need some kind of anchor. And what you're seeing here uh, is the interface on my phone and the dotted line is the software doing its best to find a level surface to place down the augmented experience that, that's been created. So uh, with, with this setup, you don't really have a lot of control where uh, as, as the artist where your viewer will see your work. So it could be anywhere, which might not be an issue, but for me, I really wanted to have things site specific and that presented a bit of a challenge. Probably more common would be this QR code. Um, these days, most phones have software baked in that just automatically recognize it. And it's also become so prolific of a symbol that we just know you hold your phone up and something something will happen. So it's become uh, common enough. Some programs will use this thing called a hero tag. Um, this one's pretty good for being able to, because of its high contrast, for being able to orient objects. So your phone has a really good sense of where it is in relation to that hero tag. But um, as an artist, it's, it's kind of an ugly shape. It's not something you necessarily want to incorporate into your work. So it also has some limitations. And then as softwares are improving, um, you're also able to add your own custom shapes and images into this. Um, but there's also some limitations as well. They need to be a very high contrast image. So this was an anchor that I was testing out with some maps that worked not, not too bad. Uh, and then another thing to consider is if you have these markers in the real world, how do they um, how do they fare over time? Will they degrade? Will they get covered in dust? Uh, will your phone be able to recognize it? So there's definitely a lot of complications to actually getting your digital art out into the, the physical world and having that work in a seamless way. So for me, the geographic reference points seemed most appealing. Um, you still need a queue to begin the experience. Uh, you can't just arrive and then your phone you know, begins the software, but uh, it's a way to at least ensure that your work will be accessible in the spot that you intend it to be. So I use my phone a lot to capture this. There's just some baked in uh, GPS uh, system or software. Um, so this, these are just the locations of the sites that I ended up grabbing as my test places. So the first software that I started messing around with was the Unreal Engine, and this is what I'll call the software heavy version. Um, it's extremely powerful. Uh, it's the most powerful of the bunch that I was using, and it's essentially a full suite video game development engine with some AR capabilities. So there's an extremely steep learning curve, um, but it also has to be packaged as an app and put into the app store if you want to be able to use it or the, the Google Play Store. So on my end as the developer, I have to pay some subscription fees to those companies. And then as a as a user or a viewer of the art, you need to download something as well. So might be okay in some situations, but to me, uh, it didn't feel as suitable to my goals in the end, mainly because of that access point and these strange, uh, all these different subscription fees. But it did allow me to put together uh, some really interesting landforms of the harbor or really create um, these landforms with 
with a lot of ease. So these are all using um, height elevation maps that I was able to actually just draw in, in black and white pretty easy. Um, and then here seeing more of the on the ground view of what that uh, other map would have looked like. Uh, the next platform I was working on was called A-Frame. And so this used, uh, this was like a no software option basically. So it's all working in HTML uh, and CSS. So it's completely web-based. Um, as, a, as a viewer, you still need to download data as you arrive or begin your experience, but there's no software that you need. It's just simply caching a website or whatever uh, is coming off of the server. Um, so for me, that that sort of represented the lowest bar to entry for the user to begin the experience. You could just show up without any um, pre-notion that there was something that you needed to have or, or to get ready for. Um, this was honestly the most frustrating of the experiences that I had using these different softwares. Um, it was really hard to get a good workflow. Uh, it was hard to see the changes immediately. They, everything had to be uploaded. Um, everything showed up differently on different devices. and it just was not that intuitive um, as an artist or as a maker, you're just staring at lines of code. But despite all that, I still think this one has the most potential, even though I had to uh, leave it behind in the end. Um, and I just uh, being able to add those geographical reference points into this one uh, was, was a pretty big pro. Here's just some samples of what I was able to kick out in some early tests. So as you can see, um, the first image on the left that's uh, on Signal Hill, but it's obviously not in the right spot. So you can see there are some errors and it trying to locate these sites. And it's a little hard to see, but I zoomed in. I actually did manage to get a boat into the harbor <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, and if this will play, yeah. So this is a video I took just outside. And again, the objects couldn't really reference quite properly in their orientation, but it was getting a little bit closer. Um, but you can see I'm just in a web browser here. So this, there's no software, just completely go to a website and it um, launches this experience for you. So lastly, I kind of resisted using this uh, platform and I'll call this one Software Lite. Uh, and this is Adobe Arrow, uh, which is a software in beta right now. So this image is the main interface that you are looking at when you're designing your augmented reality experiences. Um, in terms of what you're able to do with it, it seems pretty pretty limited right now. Maybe that's just the beta, but you are able to get going very fast. Um, you could make an augmented reality experience in, in 10 minutes if you just had you know, your objects ready. So uh, compare that to you know, weeks of learning um, Unreal Engine. So in my workflow, I started off by grabbing digital elevation models from different government databases, and I plugged them into this software called QGIS, which is a geographic information system platform that's commonly used for mapping and collecting and analyzing data. Um, you can see here, I've also generated some contour lines for everything that you're seeing, just to help me visualize uh, the different heights. Um, and this is what that raw data would have looked like first, first downloaded before any uh, modification. Uh, and then just to make it a little more clear, I added some, some contour lines. And what's kind of nice about the digital elevation models uh, with some processing in QGIS, you can actually develop three-dimensional shapes. And so that's that uh, map stretched out relative to its elevation. And I was able to create these um, skins, like basically. Next, I moved them into a, a 3D modeling program. And the one I'm most familiar with is called Rhino. So now you're seeing that shape uh, presented as a mesh. And in this program, uh, uh, way more versatile in terms of modifying these mesh files or these 3D files. Uh, and it's a little hard to see, but that's actually the St. John's Harbor in there. It's, a, it's pretty out of context right now because you're just seeing this weird meshy, meshy mix up. Um, and just to give you a sense of the scale of some of these things, um, this is a real quick pass by of that file just skimming along one side of it. 
but uh, you can see the there's quite a bit of variation in in the landform there. One thing that's kind of interesting about working with these different forms and different data are all the weird artifacting that happens because they're coming at such a big scale and they're getting compressed and stretched and we're zooming in and out. So you're starting to get these strange shapes, glitches and artifacts happening. Um, even on this one here, you can see uh, it's very polygonal. And a lot of that is just the result of this data set was meant to be viewed at a one to 50,000 sort of scale. And we're sitting here at like a one to 100 scale, really zoomed in on it. So um, it's sort of the software is doing its best to interpret what those curves might be, or it just can't. And it fills in these really rough, um, sharp edges. But it also just sort of has a very digital aesthetic about it, which um, didn't bother me for this exercise. And also what you're seeing here too, some pretty heavy distortion of the textures as um, these shapes expand and compress through the software, which were sort of glitches that I didn't predict. Uh, and so this is some of my first tests trying to get some of that information and those models into Arrow. And you can see that colorful one on the top. Uh, for whatever reason, certain file formats just really made these jarring boxy um, forms. Uh, and I was later able to get them into something a little bit more resembling uh, what you would expect a landform map to look like of the area. And then after some per persuading of the software, I was getting a little a little bit closer. So this is not quite there, but I was getting getting a lot happier with just uh, the overall visual impact and the shape. And so this one is again not attached to any specific place. Unfortunately, it's just uh, unfolds as a as a map essentially. But um, uh, I just sort of followed this trail uh, just to see where where it led me. One interesting uh, detour is just generating map, in, like still map images from what landforms I was creating. And um, these are all rendered in Rhino. So uh, it, that 3D program just has a couple of different rendering options for how it will display. I think this is called uh, like a pen outline. So it does its best to fill in the different shapes and forms using a pen-like tool. Uh, and what I found most interesting here, there's some really jaggedy shapes, uh, especially over there. And those are when I was hand drawing in some of the elevation colors, like some of the pixels were so small at the scale I was looking at, but every pixel still counts. And you're seeing these real sharp uh, height changes where I missed uh, things. So it's just kind of fun that it's filled with you know, weird data errors that uh, both from the data set and just from my own interpretation of what was going on and how different softwares handled it. And I think that's also just because it passed through so many different softwares hands, I guess, in a way. Um, I don't even know how this came to be. This was just like strange messing around with maps and it really did something wacky with the texture and created these super awesome looking wavy lines. Um, I think this is some of the, my favorite imagery and sadly I, I'm not even able to reproduce it. <laughs> it was just some like weird in the moment glitch. So RIP, but it's there at least in, in image form. Um, this is another set of images of that same data, but what you're looking at is, uh, I think they called it the technical, which is a semi x-rayish version, lined version of that same map. So it's not rendering all of the shapes, but mostly just the outlines and you're able to see through the shapes, which are, um, are shown by sort of that purpley color and behind some of the hills. Um, and by now, I think you're sort of seeing there's like a pretty strong 80s aesthetic uh, coming through in the color choices. Um, yeah, this one I was pretty, pretty happy with too. Lots of weird glitchy things going on. And then uh, we land here at the most current iteration. And uh, this is not there yet, but I'm pretty happy with uh, this version. So, um, I got the colors to be a little bit more vivid. I was able to add the 
ocean and some uh, bathymetric information that I had to make up a little bit and interpret as those maps are very difficult to find. Um, but the end result I'm, I'm really happy with. So I can imagine this as like an interactive map that you can plop down wherever you want and uh, just give you a, a, an interactive way to, to, to look at or interpret a map. Um, yeah, and, and this one too, you can sort of see I stuck the Signal Hill Tower on, on top, but it just gives you a different sense of some of the textures um, that were involved. Yeah, so I guess in, in conclusion, I think um, I was shocked to see how many challenges to using AR are still out there, despite how long the technology has been around. Uh, and I think some of this was I was pushing on the boundaries of how each software was probably intended to be used. Um, so of course, I'm going to be bumping into weird glitches and errors, but I still would like to continue to pursue this. And I think it's a really powerful tool, but it just requires a lot of thought and care about how you want to um, unravel this uh, for your specific uses. Um, and I also just wanted to take a moment to really thank the Eastern Edge staff. Everyone here has been very accommodating and welcoming and supportive and it's been very wonderful to explore St. John's and just immerse myself in this experience so thank you very much anybody have any questions we can probably actually bust it out if you have a phone if you turn the lights 